So we're going to look at some of Lilenthal's games, and you'll see, you know, that the the players that he's playing against, these are no pushovers. For example, this first game is against world champion Mikhail Botvinnik, and it just shows you the type of class this player was. Now, remember that some of you or some people in the chess world believe that if you're not the world champion, you're just a scum player. But you have to realize that only one person can be the world champion. And you have to have some fortune, some great skill, um, some opportunities that others didn't have. And then when you finally get your chance to play in a match, you also have to win it. <laughs> so it's very difficult to become a world champion. And it's just important to realize that there can be other there can be other great chess players who weren't world champions, but were still killer chess players. And I think that's just an important thing to say before uh, we get started. So let's have a look at this game. This is our first game, and we have a we have here a game between Lelenthal and Mik Mikhail Botvinnik, world champion Botvinnik, and. Okay, so it starts off as a Queen's Indian defense. So in this position, after the move e6, if white plays knight to c3, most players in this position uh, play bishop to b4. And, you know, the reason for that is you're preventing the move e4 by pinning the knight. That's called the Nimzo Indian defense. If white chooses to avoid the Nimzo Indian defense and play the move knight to f3, white isn't threatening to go e4, so black has time to play this opening called the queen's Indian defense, which is a fianchetto of the queen's bishop. So that goes b6. And again, white is not threatening to play e4 at this present time. So we have b6 and bishop to b7 coming, and black intends to bring his bishop to this diagonal. And that's called the queen's Indian defense, and that's a very common defense in this particular, uh, particular setup. g3, uh, this is still to this day, and this game was played, you know, seven, you know, 60 more than, like 70, 80 years ago. Wow, this was played 80 years ago. Okay, this game was played 80 years ago. Uh, this move is still considered the most challenging move, countering the fianchetto with the fianchetto. And I would say that the difference is when you get a position like this, where you counter a fianchetto with bishop with a fianchetto, is the king's bishop is protected. The queen's bishop is unprotected, and that can be a tactical weakness for black in some cases where there's a discovered attack and that guy's not defended. So, you know, black always has to be very, very, very cautious about that. Okay, castles, perfectly normal so far. Knight to c3, all normal, all normal. And here, black plays to this day, still considered the best move, knight to e4. And the purpose of knight to e4 is to try to control that e4 square, trade off a pair of knights, and maybe shuffle this knight over to the king's side, just giving that knight a place to go. This is all normal. Black doesn't want, or white doesn't want black's knight sitting in the center for too long, so white plays queen to c2. All, by the way, been played thousands of times to this day. You know, been played thousands of times this position. It's a, it's a very logical position. Okay, white is now trying to get rid of the knight. Black trades the knight off. White captures back with the queen to preserve the pawn structure. Black plays d6. And the purpose of the move d6 is to bring the knight into the game. And the reason you don't want to just play knight to c6, for example, is you would block your bishop's diagonal and your knight on c6 wouldn't actually have any place to go. So, okay, so d6 is normal. Queen to c queen back to c2. White wants to play the very strong move, pawn to e4, taking over the center of the board. So black plays f5. 
And again, for for now, and this is pretty typical in the opening phase of the game, black is just sort of reacting to white's play. Like, okay, white wanted to take over the center, so black played f5 to clamp down on that square a little bit. Okay, in this position, white played the move knight to e1, or Lilenthal played knight to e1. And yeah, it is pass pawn. It's sort of like a Dutch, but not exactly because, uh, you know, sort of a delayed Dutch, if you will. But it does have, it does have hints of being a Dutch. And this bishop is already committed to this diagonal. So knight e1, trying to trade these bishops off. And here's the idea. Because these pawns have advanced, white wants to trade these bishops off. And if white can do this, then white will look to take advantage of all of the weak white squares by you know, advancing the knight into the middle, attacking these pawns, playing the pawn up to d5, clamping down on these squares, and white will have a very good game. Black will be missing the light squared bishop that was covering all those weak squares. Okay, so knight to c6 was played by Botvinnik. So, again, you know my opinion about the move knight to c6. I don't really like the move knight to c6, but Lilenthal punishes it pretty well. He goes d5, Botvinnik trades, and then Botvinnik plays a very, very, very surprising move to me. Extremely surprising move. And he gets punished for it greatly. He was way too... Uh, way too optimistic about this potential maneuver. So he played knight to b4. And knight to b4 is just not a good move because, first of all, yes, you're attacking my queen and you are attacking the pawn, but I'm going to move my queen. That's pretty... I mean, nothing. it's not a tactical position. I'm just going to move my queen. And... Your knight is unstable, and it's crossed over into my territory. So you're not going to have, like, the resources to keep your knight there forever. So, Lelenthal played queen to d2, attacking the knight and guarding the pawn, and said, what's your intention? Well, Botvinnik was thinking, in, his, in the perfect scenario, he would play... Knight a6 in some fashion. Knight a6. So knight to, e, knight to a6, knight to c5, and try to get into e4. But before I talk about that long-winded plan for black, because that knight is not ready to get there anytime soon, by allowing this capture of the pawns, black has given himself, other than this distant knight, that's sort of not in, in not in tango with the rest of Black's position. What else did Black give White, which White is going to use against Black fairly shortly? So, of course, you know it's a it's a more of a pawn structure thing. Uh, it you know think about it as when you're looking at the pawn structure here. You know what has White achieved other than just picking on this misplaced knight? Okay, so Dastro says the e6 outpost. There's more, though. But I do agree with that. e6 is a very strong square for a piece. White has space, but white sort of had space anyway. And that's not uncommon in this. Yes, Sergi. Yes, the c pawn is weak. And it's on an open file. That's called a backwards pawn. And the, pawn, the uh, square c6 is weak. Because there's a lot of pressure. This pawn really clamps down on these two squares. And combined with the bishop, that's very powerful. The c7 pawn is very weak. And yeah, there's so many weaknesses looming in Botvinnik's position. Uh, but okay, for right now, it's the knight is in question. So black played the move a5. So Botvinnik played a5. And what he's looking to do is play knight a6 and knight to c5 to get his knight back into the game. Because, I mean, after a3, the knight has to go back to a6, 
and there wouldn't really be a logical place for this knight to go. Like, there wouldn't be another place for this knight to go. I mean, other than here. So, it's clear Bodvinik was hoping for this maneuver. But Lilenthal was like, no, 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 no. I'm not here, world champion Bodvinik. I am not here to help you out. So, what very uh, alert move did Lilenthal play here as just to not allow Bodvinik this ease of, of completing his minor piece development. Very good, everyone. Awesome job. So B4. Yep. And now black is in a lot of trouble, in my opinion, because white has no weaknesses, and black's coordination is, is terrible. The bishop is, muff, is blocked by this pawn. The knight is dominated by the B pawn. The C file is against black, so white has a natural place to put their rooks on the C file. And after b4, white even can play the move bishop to b2 and get that bishop to a nice diagonal. And the knight on e1 is probably white's most, I don't know, uh, it's probably the piece that sticks out the most in white's camp. But like, okay, we need to improve that piece, but it's not going to be hard to. One method of development that I could see for white is knight to d3, knight to f4, and knight into e6. That seems like a very strong uh, development. You could also play knight to f3, knight to d4, and then you would have access to both of those weaknesses, and maybe the b5 square if you wanted to go that route. So this isn't a bad piece long term, but this piece as long as this pawn remains, is a bad piece long term. I can't really see its prospects. So, bishop f6 was played by Bodvinik, bishop to b2, Lilenthal was like, you know, this is clearly black's best minor piece. So, if you want to play, if you want to exchange your very beautiful bishop for my just recently developed bishop, then go ahead. So, Bodvinik played Queen to d7, Lilenthal was like, okay, we're going to get rid of your strongest piece. And then he went about improving his pieces slowly. And this whole game is really, you're going to see White playing a very beautiful strategic game against Botvinnik, who very hastily played that knight to b4 move. And he's really regretting that now because that, that knight is, you know, it's, this b4 move really puts a damper in that knight. I mean, that knight is just so sad. I mean, you think about it, you're like, how am I going to defend that knight? And you just, it's just a sad day in the neighborhood. You know, this knight has improved itself. It's heading for squares within the black camp. So essentially, black here is playing without a piece. On top of that, black's going to have to reckon with the pressure down the c file. So that's coming. So A4, Botvinnik play. I can't, I don't really understand that move, but I guess it was just to avoid losing a pawn here. So A4, but again, once that tension is released from here, the queen doesn't even need to stay there to guard the B pawn anymore. So she's free to go. So Rook to C1, very logical play because the C pawn is backwards, mainly thanks to this clamping pawn here on D5. So, you know, you can't really ever move the C-pawn. Queen F7, Knight to F4. This not only guards the D-pawn, the very strong D-pawn, but again, it also eyeballs this E6 square. And again, this B-pawn doing great work here, stopping the Knight from going to its only natural square. So we're going to keep that pawn there. You know, we, we definitely don't want to go b5 and allow the knight into c5. That would also block our file. So bishop to c8 was played as to cover the e6 square. And now I'm a little bit curious, but play logically here for white. I want the chat's opinion about this. So I want you to play a logical move here from white. And I'll give you credit for multiple answers. I just want you to get the right idea. So what should white play here? So Rickle says rook c3, Dastro says rook c6, and Nightmare says double on the c file. All of those are correct in, in the sense that 
the the objective should be to maximize the potential of all of your pieces before doing anything else. So, indeed, Lilenthal played rook to c3. Because black is not threatening anything, black's queen side is, you know, totally uncoordinated here, and white's just saying, listen, you've got a backwards pawn here, you've got some crummy pieces here, I'm just going to keep developing my pieces to their maximum. There's nothing smarter than doubling on the open file in a position where not, nothing else is really going on, right? There's half open file here against the backwards pawn, double. So bishop to d7, rook f to c1, beautiful so far, right? Just good strategic play. And I remind you, because I remind you every time I stream, and I'm telling, I always tell you, if you just listen to the lectures, I'm always going to give you practical chess development tips. Uh, the strategic part of chess, that's what happens first, usually. So I build my position, I get all of my pieces into the game, my opponent may react to that, to those threats or whatever, and then eventually the tactics are going to occur. So, but right now, tactics aren't happening, it's just Lilenthal is just trying to prepare his forces before doing anything else. And I think that makes a lot of sense because black isn't really threatening anything. So h6 was played, white played h4. He says, okay, if you want to weaken your king side, you're, I'm not going to let you play g5 without consequence. If you go g5, I'm going to capture, and then I'm going to play knight to e6, where thanks to the exchange of the pawns, that leaves your g-pawn unprotected. You can't capture me here because when I capture back, I'm attacking your queen and I'm discovered attacking your rook in the corner. On top of that, I'm also attacking the pawn. So h4 was a very strong move, which really stops the g5 idea. Rook to a7 was played. That is to guard this pawn and also to get off of this diagonal. And I really like, again, more screw-tightening moves here by Lilenthal. What did white play here as to really just suffocate black completely and not allow black any possible break within the position? You know, one way to really tie down your opponent is eliminate pawn play from your opponent. So... White has already done that in a lot of ways. You know, the pawn play on the queen side, thanks to this pawn and the en passant rule, has been limited. And all this, this pawn is blockaded by the knight. So as some of you in the chat were, are saying, pawn to h5 is a beautiful clamping move, which eliminates the possible pawn play from, from the king side because of the en passant rule. So yeah. So you look at this position, and if... You should just want to cry. Like, you would not want to be black here. And the fact that black is Mikhail Botvinnik speaks volumes to this because Botvinnik be later became the world champion. So, maybe Lilenthal, you know, Lilenthal gave him this positional beating and then, and then Botvinnik was like, I need to go read some positional chess books and then he eventually did and, of course, became the world champion. But this is just incredible, like, what Lilenthal is doing here. He is eliminating all possible pawn play from black. On top of that, black is just black's position is just riddled with weaknesses. You've got the backwards C pawn, he's got the outpost here, got an outpost here, got an outpost here. You have this sideline knight on a6 with no way to improve. Thanks. I mean, white's pieces couldn't really be better. And now, you know, put to put it in perspective though, even if you got this far in a chess game, completely just annihilating your opponent. The question would be, you know, would you be able to finish the game? Because at this point in time, the strategic play has worked in favor for white. That's no doubt about it. But material's still even. And you still have to win the game. And that's the struggle that many chess players have, is like, even if they get good positions, it's sort of like, okay, like, well, I think Lowenthal's showing us how you, you, you milk a position. Because here's what he's saying. 
I have all the positional trumps, so I lock my opponent down first. As they're squirming and scratching and clawing their way out of their crappy position, then I'm going to hit them with a tactic. I'm just going to just clobber them with a tactic because they're going to have to do some, you know, contortionist type things to get their pieces developed. And then you wait for your shot. But, but he's not doing anything because he's just improving. So rook back to a8, Botvinnik realizes that he's not getting anywhere with that. So there's immense pressure here. Lilenthal just jammed this pawn right into the heart of Black's position. So there's no pawn play here. There's no pawn play here. And there's no, there's no way uh, to improve this knight. So Lilenthal's like, hmm, I need some other action though. As long as this knight stays on a6, then I can't really get here unless I'm willing to sacrifice the exchange. So he shifts his rook to the e3 square and he goes... I'm going to try to get into the e6 square. Okay? So, king h7 was played. And I really like this move. He, fe he plays rook on c to c3. Okay? So, rook c on c3. And he's just loading up the pieces. Rook to b8. Queen to d3. Alright, so... We, uh, we are attacking this knight. Rook goes back to a8, and now knight to g6. And the knight's jumping into the position. You have, of course, the rook on the open file threatening to, to enter on the e7 square. The rook, on, the rook on a8 cannot move because the, the knight on a6 would hang, and rook is coming into e7. So this is, this is just a, a massacre. Here. I mean, as far as the position goes, an absolute annihilation of Botvinnik here. So rook e7 is coming. You really have to stop that because it's also a fork to the queen and the bishop. So Botvinnik sacrifices the exchange, and this might have come as a relief to him, to be completely honest, given the position he had before, where he couldn't do anything at all. Here, it's like, okay, I sacrificed the exchange... And I got a pawn, you know, for my exchange. But I can at least move again, right? The problem is that really the play is directed against this pathetic knight on a6, which has been Black's problem the whole time. So it, the game didn't conclude without any mini tactics, though. Here, Lelenthal played rook to e6, which I think is a very powerful move. So he's blocking the bishop's communication on the pawn. And you can't take this rook because if you take the rook, after pawn takes, we attack the queen and we attack the rook on a8. And that's a tactic that we saw a little bit earlier as well. So it's not a sacrifice. It's a, just a mini combination. So rook to e6. The king goes back to h7. And Lilenthal plays g4 attacking the pin piece. So, really, he hasn't done anything that I would say you as viewers wouldn't be able to see, I mean, in terms of the depth of calculation, but he's done a really good job of strategically, you know, strategically placing his pieces. And as a consequence, these sort of moves are just flowing and they don't need much, you know, they don't need advanced tactical vision. C5 was played. He's trying to free himself a little bit. And the funny thing, I, I mean, I think the funny thing about this particular moment was that the C5 pawn, you know, you don't want to take on Passan because then you lose a whole rook, right? So as before. But the funny thing about the C5 pawn is it takes away the C5 square from the knight. So now white played <laughs> B5. Which was a move White had been, you know, holding off playing for the whole game because he didn't want to allow the knight to get to c5. But it's so funny that now when the pawn is on c5, you know, Black can't use that square. So the knight drops back. Lelenthal captures. Knight takes. And now pawn to f6. Actually a 
devastating move, which again is designed to destroy the barrier around the king, king to g8, and now rook to c4. And all of, all of white's pieces are just climbing, just clawing at the black position here. Rook is coming over to g4 to line up the attack here. And again, this rook isn't hanging for the same reason. If you take it, I attack your queen and I attack your rook. So, okay, so the rook is still not on pre. Rook to e8, rook to g4, just going straight for the throat here. Pawn to g5 was played by Botvinnik. He doesn't want to lose his pawn on g7 and, and possibly the queen. And Lilenthal finishes with a flurry of tactics here, but I think it's sort of nice. So he trades rooks, which isn't a tactic, of course. Then he plays rook to e4. So his objective is to play rook to e7. You can't take this pawn because that would leave your bishop unprotected. And so rook to e7 is coming where the idea is to get on the 7th rank and to eyeball possibly bringing the queen down as well. So king f8 was played, rook e7 anyway, queen to g6 says let's trade. He's like, no, I don't want to trade. Let's chase your queen around for just a second. And in this position, very similar to the previous one, except the bishop went from here to here, Lowenthal played a nice combination to finish the game. I would like for the chat to find it. So white to play and finish the game here. Yeah, it's, it's actually rook captures e8. Check. So this forces matters quite a bit because here's the idea. If you take with your king, you lose your queen. So you have to take with your queen, right? You have to take with your queen. And then the idea was queen to h7, threatening checkmate. Now, what's the logical way to stop that? Queen to f7. And his calculation was as follows, which is just beautiful. Check. There's only one legal move. The queen has to drop back to block. Queen captures h6, check. Your king either has to move here or here. Those are the only logical moves. But then bishop to h5, the move that a lot of you wanted to play a little bit earlier, comes in and supports the pawn forward. So for example, king to e8, bishop to h5, king to d7, pawn f7, and nothing stops the pawn from, from promoting. Hi, I'm Peter Giannatos, founder of the Charlotte Chess Center. Subscribing to our YouTube channel is statistically proven to limit your blunders.